They build you up, they build you up. She's an icon, she's an intellectual. I'm not, I left school when I was 16. Jamil Jamil claps back. I never wanted to be an actress, but these things happened by mistake. I fell into them. The breakout star on toxic tabloids. My life got turned upside down quickly, where all of a sudden just smear campaign after smear campaign. Sets the record straight on royal rumors. The Meghan Markle thing has been really interesting. And why activism is her passion. I would like to see people in power and people with privilege, opening their purses, opening their mouths. Outspoken. We love to make women seem hysterical. Unbothered. When it comes to people's opinions of me, I don't give a flying I really don't. Can't wait for you guys to get into my conversation with actress Jamila Jamil. And don't forget to stick around for a very special Discover Spotlight featuring author and personal finance expert, the broke millennial, Aaron Lowry. Hey, Jamila, it's uh, really nice to see you. It's been too long. Yeah, it's nice to see you. I wish you were here in person. I hate bloody COVID. Yeah, me too. I'm ready for this doggone thing to be over. Have you done anything interesting? Have you just kind of been locked away the whole time? Or what have you been up to? I've been on some mini breaks with friends. I've had this new thing I've just learned about called weekends. Unbelievable. Everyone should try them. <laughs> I've never participated in those. I've forgotten how to act. I've forgotten how to host. I can now only podcast, chat, and um, still can't bake for shit. I love it. That's what bakeries are for. My guest is the British actress, activist, and model Jamila Jamil. Yeah, wait a minute, right here. There yeah. we go. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And congratulations on what is it, season three now? Season four of The Good Place. I haven't been this upset since my good friend Taylor was rudely upstaged by my other friend Kanye. He was defending my best friend, Beyonce. I would say I outdid myself, but I'm always this good. So I simply did myself. We have to talk about The Good Place because we're all fans of you from that show. Before that, I did your job. I was a host. No. Yeah. Hello, now I have the pleasure of being joined by an 18-year-old, and it's been said about her, when that girl opens her mouth, angels fly out. When I open my mouth, Food usually flies out, so that sounds better. I remember being a teenage model when I was 15, starving myself thinking that that would bring me success or something like a cover of Vogue, and it's so amazing to find myself 20 years later uh, and 30 pounds heavier actually being on the cover because I've been fighting against that exact rhetoric. Hey, uh, tell me about the most interesting uh, conversations you've had uh, during the, all this craziness. I feel as though I have had no mundane or disappointing conversations this year. It feels as though we're all challenging ourselves and each other. But again, I understand that I'm talking about my bubble in my very cosmopolitan and you know progressive city. I'm aware that that's not happening everywhere. I'm just saying from my own personal perspective, there have been too many, too many good conversations. Do you feel like you've changed at all during this time with uh, COVID or are you kind of the same person, but obviously locked inside and still not baking properly? I have become calmer in some ways, more anxious and frantic in others because I'm scared about what's happening to other people in the world. But I think I've become more settled in not moving around. I think I've developed more faith in humanity. You know, while we've seen terrible injustices exposed, we've also seen the way that the world has responded. And I, by that, I don't mean politicians, but I feel as though the people have changed. Our collective consciousness has shifted. And I feel as though our value systems have completely shifted. And so this love of celebrity and, and materialism and consumerism and capitalism obsession, they are not valuable. They are not helpful to our society. And I think that people have realized that the true heroes, the people who really deserve all of our worship and our attention and our adulation are the frontline workers and essential care and healthcare workers. Jamil, are you hopeful that this is long lasting or, or are you worried like a lot of us that this may be kind of fleeting? Where's, where's your heart? I think it's happened for too long. This wasn't a month or two months. Like we're going on month eight of this and there's gonna be a second wave. We're gonna be going through this till next March. I don't think anyone's ever going to forget this moment. I don't know how we can. Do I think everything's fixed and it's all gonna be saved now? No, but I do think that we have not had the opportunity to be distracted by all the bull we were distracted by before. And so I think that it's a really, really palpable moment of change. You can see that people's entire perspectives have shifted and I don't see them going back. 
Jamila, so for people who are kind of struggling to see where all this can go, maybe try and paint a little bit of a picture. Where do you hope things will be a year from now, two years from now? I would like to see less division amongst uh, subgroups within major groups. I really feel as though there is a better way for us to approach our oppressor. And so I would love more collective understanding, more empathy. I would like to see more celebrities using their bloody voices and platforms to help and people in power and people with privilege, opening their purses, opening their mouths. I would also like the way that we talk to each other online to change. I'm hoping that there will be more kindness, more empathy, and you know, more awareness of the fact that kids are watching us. They're watching the way that we talk to each other online. You know, one of the things you said at the outset that I really liked hearing is you said you've become calmer, you said you're more hopeful. One of the things that was going on, like while I was on this kind of rise, I, I was in so much chaos. Like I was filming 16 hours a day and then coming home and then working on my activism company or helping change laws or change global policies. The life of an activist is no, it's no fun. Once you speak out about one cause, people expect you to speak out about absolutely everything and just they expect you to be Batman. And I think especially as a woman, I feel like an extra obligation to just help and nurture and do whatever I can. And so, I was exhausted and I feel as though I suffered some kind of arrested development over the last two years where you don't have time to process everything that's happening. And at the same time, my career was exploding in a way that I just didn't expect. I didn't think any of this was going to happen. And so I, I wasn't being able to understand exactly what was happening and have time to heal from it because it can be quite, all of it can be like a little bit traumatic and stressful. I was sort of hanging on by a thread by March, and this year to just be able to somewhat calm down has gifted me time to process, catch up, understand what happened, and now learn how to explain it to other people. Because so I think I've learned a lot about how this industry works and how it has influenced our general internalized misogyny, both in, well, in all genders. Hey, Jamila, talk to me a little bit about one of the conversations you and I have had a lot, which is about women who speak up often get enormous amounts of pushback. Has that also figured into some of the conversations you've been having with friends over the last six to eight months? You said, for instance, the Kardashians, their pockets are lined with the blood and diarrhea of teenage girls. White men don't seem to have to have a filter in our day and age, especially not the more successful ones. Piers Morgan, Donald Trump. I reserve that same right, mm -hmm. and so I say whatever I want. My life got turned upside down briefly, where all of a sudden, just smear campaign after smear campaign hit me. Many were upset when the news broke that Jamila Jamil and Megan Thee Stallion would both be judges on the show. Shortly after, Jamila took to her Twitter and came out as queer, and she has now further explained the reasons behind the casting. This show is not supposed to be the be-all and end-all. Megan and I are here to help get the show off the grounds so that loads of people see it, and then as a result of that, people recognize this culture and then start to center those stars. I had the, what truly felt like the entire internet for a while commenting on my sexuality, commenting on my integrity, my mental health, my physical health, my physical health of my family, uh, disabled members of my family's photographs floating around the internet with disparaging comments about them, and they're not in the public eye, they didn't choose this, they haven't gone ahead and asked for any of this kind of attention. And I was accused of all kinds of things that I had never done or been a part of. It made me completely rethink everything I've ever thought about truly any woman in media. I'm really glad it happened because it's changed my entire perspective on everything. And now I want to fight harder. And, you know, I don't have anything to lose because I never wanted to be famous. I never wanted to be an actress. I never wanted to be a TV host. These things happened by mistake. I fell into them. And so this is why I'm here. This is why the universe has somehow put me in this position is to be able to just be transparent and tell people the truth of what I learned from what is an unbelievably toxic industry. This is not just show business and media is not just entertainment. Like, this bleeds into our culture and that bleeds into our society. 
And so I think it's really important that people understand how this works and how far this goes back. Jamila, would you take me into that a little bit more? Because again, to your point, very few people actually go to and through what you went through. Like, give me a little bit of your narrative. How did all of this start and how did we get to where we are? You know, I remember 2018, I was, you know, the sort of new girl in town on this big, you know, hit, critically acclaimed comedy show. And I, you know, I had the aesthetic of someone who would just come in and play the part, you know, just be the good girl and talk about just my hair and, you know, be polite and maybe, you know, try and seem a little bit innocent and sexy in men's magazines and that's fine. I'm not disrespecting anyone who chooses to do that, but instead I just came out effing and blinding and calling out injustices and not participating in the diet culture that was offering me so much money to participate in. And I had principles and I was calling out the lies in this industry and I was calling out powerful people within this industry. So it immediately kind of caught people's attention and then the mania kind of started of where they start to hyperbolize how great you are. <laughs> and they start saying like, oh, the feminist hero we need. Oh, she's Gandhi. Um, and they start every single time you fart, it makes front news. <laughs> and people start to become sick of your, I became sick of my own face. And there was nothing I could do to stop it unless I completely stopped speaking. But I have to keep speaking because there are injustices ongoing in this world. So they build you up, they build you up. She's she's an icon, she's an intellectual. I'm not, I left school when I was 16. I've never said I was an intellectual. I've been saying I'm a feminist in progress from the start. And, and I knew it was coming. Like I, the more I was being bigged up, I was named like Time Magazine's, one of Time Magazine's 25 most influential people on the internet, alongside people way more famous than me. And I just thought, oh shit when it was happening. I was never excited. Everyone else was like, isn't this amazing? And I was like, no, this is terrible. Oh, you saw it coming. Oh, I saw it coming. I mean, I'm I'm in my thirties. Like I've seen this happen to woman after woman after woman after woman. You just feel like you're on a roller coaster ride. I was always waiting for that moment that I peaked for it just to be a straight death drop down. And, and it invariably is, and it was. They built me up, overexposed me, made people sick of me, made it look like I'm just always screaming on a soapbox, which I'm not. But we love to make women seem hysterical. I think we need more of a culture of women sticking together, and standing up for each other, and we see injustice, speaking out about it. I think AOC is the queen of that. She's truly my hero of this generation. Treating people with dignity and respect makes a decent man. I've, I've never been more inspired by another human being. Our home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully, dream fearlessly. Jamila, do you find good allyship these days from straight men? And if so, who are they? And maybe even more importantly, like, do you feel like it's growing? I would say post Me Too, there are more outspoken men than ever before. Um, I live with one of them, and that's my boyfriend. And Matt McGorry is another wonderful man who speaks out about so many different important subjects and things that do not relate to his own experience. I think he's really cool. Ibram Kendi, uh, Matthew Cherry, there are so many men now stepping up post understanding how collectively horrendous the experience of women has been um, that I think are finally stepping out and, and really being vocal allies of the experience of women. Hey Jamila, would you talk to me about another woman who you've also spoken up for who probably fits a lot of what you and I have talked about, Meghan Markle? The Meghan Markle thing has been really interesting. I didn't know her when she put me on the cover of Vogue. She was a perfect example of what we will do to a prominent woman who stands out. She was also a perfect example of how misogynist and quite racist the UK media are in this very insidious and gross way. Uh, the first time I started hearing about her was when she became engaged to Prince Harry. And I remember seeing this headline that said that she will certainly thicken the royal blue blood with her exotic DNA. And so to see that disgusting sentence hyper-normalized in, in this day and age, just because you have a woman of color, a black woman, joining the royal family officially, uh, made me very kind of 
fearful of what kind of generation we're in that this is acceptable. I was speaking out because this was a, a woman and this was a woman of color who was being brutally abused in front of us. And then I um, was selected by Megan and Edward Enifil for uh, the cover of Vogue as one of their kind of forces for change. It was a massive moment for me. I was super grateful. I didn't know though until a couple of days before the issue came out that Megan had anything to do with it. They kept the whole thing completely secret and I received a phone call from her uh, just to say that she's a genuine fan of my work, my activism. She really cares about mental health and feminism and uh, she was incredibly respectful and kind over the phone. Uh, uh, I believe Harry was there. I don't remember if he was actually on the call. I don't think so. And that was it, really. That, there was no, like, there was, you know, no moment beyond that. Jamila, one of the things we love to talk about on the show is how people dream fearlessly. I can tell you're really in the moment right now, but if you can, where do you see yourself? Where do you see our world five, 10, maybe 20 years out? My hope is that I weigh continues to thrive and we become a, uh, a strong voice in media and a great starting platform for young beginners and you know young filmmakers and documentary makers. And we eventually are able to publish the writing of or give people their own podcasts. So I just want to become a media company that is for the youth and that is for marginalized kids to no longer feel like they are just a token, to feel like a valued educator. Jamila, has your work with iWay and even kind of your mission around iWay changed at all during these last six to eight months? It's become my dream. I never wanted to do all of this on my own. I never wanted to be the face of anything. But I think for a while it was a matter of, if not me, then who right now? Because no one else in my position is speaking up in any like true meaningful way. Uh, and risking what they have enough right now. So I took that spot for a minute to be able to create attention around the causes that I cared about, but now I'm able to hand that over to these great young activists who have so many wonderful ideas, so many wonderful messages, they're doing such great work. And so it is a like thriving YouTube channel. We're now turning it into long form uh, entertainment and long form factual entertainment. We are just able to cover so much ground, so many different communities. And it feels like such a radically inclusive space, something that I was dreamed of having to turn to as a kid. I finally made that space where whoever you are, wherever you're from, however old you are, whatever you look like, you will see someone who looks like you on the pages of iWay. And I feel immensely proud of that. All right, Jamila, time for a little fun. I want to do something I call rapid fire. So if you're ready, here I go. Okay. I know you've talked about how tough and how difficult this work is. Who's helped you? Who's been your sounding board, your best advisors, your rabbis, your Sherpas? I have a great relationship. And so I have a very supportive boyfriend. I also have a very supportive small network of friends. And I now have access to therapy which I'm doing over Zoom. <laughs> Jamila, what else do you have your eye on in the world? I'm paying attention to young activists. That's the thing that I'm most paying attention to at the moment. The kids have all of the answers. The work that they are doing around climate change and climate awareness, Isra Hersey, Greta Thunberg, all kinds of different kids out there who are just blowing my mind. They have a way better idea of how to run this world than, than the older generation. Hey Jamila, what would surprise people if they got to know you a little bit better? I mean, especially those people who think they know you well. Give me a couple things that may catch them off guard. I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't care. That's how I feel about that. When it comes to people's opinions of me, I don't give a flying I really don't. All right, Jamila, I really wish I was there, but I'm still glad that we did this anyways, and I hope that things get healthier and I actually get to see you in person and hope it doesn't take until March because that sounds like a long time. You're one of the good allies. You're one of the good men who cares about women and listens to women. I forgot to say you. Now it's time for our Discover Spotlight with the broke millennial, Aaron Lowry. 
Understanding your finances can be no easy task. In fact, taking small, meaningful steps can make an entire difference towards a brighter financial future. That's why we've created an amazing new segment every Friday. It's called Brighter Financial Fridays in partnership with Discover. Now, I'm pleased to welcome back my friend Erin Lowry. You guys know her as the author of the Broke Millennial series. She's always got amazing insights on all matters financial. Erin, great to see you again. Great to be here. We're all living online more and more, so much so that 2020 has seen a 30% spike in global internet traffic. That means more people are paying bills, catching up with family, hanging out with colleagues online which is why it's more important than ever before to be cyber savvy and to help protect yourself from identity theft. Hey, Aaron, tell me a little bit about some of the basics around identity theft that maybe a lot of us miss. Well, I think a big thing with identity theft is right now we've been locked at home and sure, the internet is wonderful for keeping us in touch with our loved ones and perhaps working remotely. And we've been doing a lot of online shopping, getting everything we need with the click of a button. But with all of that also comes a rise of the risk of digital identity theft. And it's something most of us don't think about, but can really screw up our financial lives. And so say more, I mean, like conceptually, I get it. If someone hacks into my bank account or someone steals my credit card, I know that, you know, life can become difficult. But if you've never gone through it before, make it plain for someone who hasn't experienced the pain firsthand. Well, you just did touch on two of the major pain points. And one is the idea of your credit card information can get stolen and fraudulent charges. The other thing is there could be access directly to your bank account, money taking out, or someone could get your information and start opening up accounts in your name. A study from Javelin Insights and Research found the consumers themselves were responsible for $3.5 billion of fraudulent charges. And what I mean by responsible is that it was on them to pay it back. It wasn't necessarily stuff that could get just get discharged. Have you ever been a victim of identity theft? Have you ever been impacted or anyone in your family? I have. I've been a victim of identity theft, as has my sister, and it is so overwhelming to deal with. I actually had $600 stolen out of my checking account, and that was also at a point in my life where $600, I didn't have a huge amount of savings. That was going to mean I couldn't pay rent if I didn't get that money back quickly enough. Luckily, I noticed it fast. I reported it, was able to prove that I didn't actually make those purchases. And because they had gotten my debit card information, they were able to actually take money directly out of my checking account. It wasn't just credit card fraud. So what, so what can you do? Like, what do smart people do? What advice do you give people who either are experiencing this or want to avoid this happening in the first place? Well, one of the big simple things you can do is frequently change your passwords, especially to financial accounts. Make sure that they don't match other things like your email account and your bank account and the other accounts that you use maybe for social media. So if there is a hack and your information is vulnerable, then you make sure that they're all different. Change them on a regular basis. And you should also set up two-factor authentication on anything that gives you the option to, particularly with your financial accounts, to ensure that you have to prove that you are who you say you are. So a scammer can't get easy access. That's a good one. I, You know, it's funny. I'm often offered the opportunity to do two-factor and you're like, I'm busy. I don't want to do it. But I think you're right. Given the risk of that, that probably makes sense. Uh, I think that makes a ton of sense. What else can I do? What Are there other interesting tools or there services that can help me out both to avoid trouble in the first place or deal with it once it's happened? Fortunately, there are tools out there that you can get access to. For instance, with Discover, you can use Discover's social security alerts. So what that does is it makes sure that Discover is scouring the thousands of dark websites that exist. If your social security flags, they will alert you. And this is actually a free tool for Discover card members. All you have to do is activate it. Interesting. So say more. How complicated is it? Do I just go online and I get access to it? Do I have to pay for it? Well, particularly if you're a Discover card member, it is free. All you have to do is go and activate it. So I know for me, as soon as I realized it was available, I was like, yes, please, let's go, because I'm not on the dark web trolling to see if my social security number is potentially compromised. So it's nice to know that somebody else is doing it for me. So it's a really good way for you to be proactive instead of having to deal with the pain of being reactive. 
Aaron, thank you so much. Hey guys, it's so important that we all get smart about our cybersecurity, right? Like we absolutely have to. And it's great that if you're a Discover Card member, you can sign up for free social security alerts. So if you want to learn more, if you want to make that happen, go to discover.com slash free alerts. Uh, Aaron and Discover, thank you guys again for another brighter financial Friday. And Aaron, I hope to see you again. Keep bringing me the good stuff. Uh, really appreciate it. You're helping all of us. Hey, I hope you love my girl, Jamila Jamil. Uh, I've, I've really come to like her a lot. She's a friend, not just someone I've come to admire. I think she's smart, she's interesting, she's strong, she's funny, very funny. In fact, I think she's inappropriate, which is a really high compliment in my world. I appreciate her, I appreciate her openness. I love that the fact that she's not only spoken out on behalf of herself, but other people. She's one of those people who like swings the door open wide, and I think that's a good thing I think the world needs more of that. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed her come up story. If you did, don't forget what to do. Subscribe, tell a friend, and then go for all the good stuff. Listen to the podcast. It's got the whole deal. I'll see you soon. Hey, tune into the Carlos Watson Show. It's like no other. You're going to enjoy it every weekday on YouTube.